But anyway, we do have a fantastic panel here to talk about all things political, really, and cannabis law reform. My name is Steve Bolt. I'm not a politician. I do vote. I do care. But all these other people are people who are professionally engaged, pretty much, in the science of politics, with one perhaps exception, a later addition to the panel, Fizzer from Canada. If I get people's names right, and sorry if I don't, from the very far end in the white shirt, Glenn Jury, a professional person, I think it's fair to say, in terms of political processes, uh, someone an electoral expert, a consultant to a number of smaller parties in particular. Poor man can't go anywhere without being called the preference whisperer, as Darren has just pointed out to me, so there I've gone and said it. <laughs> uh, next to him, Damon Adams, representing the Weeded Warriors. It's a fairly new organisation of veterans, military veterans. Uh, Damon like himself is an ex-police officer rather than military, but uh, people involved in uh, supporting veterans and ex-police and ex-people in uniform who are now dealing with post-traumatic stress and other um, anxiety-related conditions with the assistance of cannabis. So uh, uh, David has a lot to say on the subject. Next to him, David Shoebridge, Member of Parliament for New South Wales for the Greens Party in the Upper House. Good long-time friend of Mardi Gras, so here he is again. So thank you, David. Gabe Buckley in the loudest <laughs> clothing on the, on the stage anyway, the loud suit, Gabe Buckley from the Liberal Democrats, not actually a politician, but representing the Liberal Democrats party today, uh, and pleased to say, he told me that they've just done, got a second member of parliament now in WA, so there you go. Next to him, local hero, Andrew Cavasillis, representing the Hemp Party. <laughs> Everyone in Limbo, everyone at Mardi Gras knows what a fantastic job Andrew's done over the years. Takes someone to do the introduction, we're out of time almost soon. Anyway, next to him, a visitor from Canada, Rob Laurie. Not a politician, a lawyer, but someone who knows a lot about the scene in Canada. Uh, a, a lawyer who knows lots about the processes of Canada going through them in terms of legalising cannabis, so that's all good. And he'll talk to us as well. And next to me, a face you've seen before. Senator Darren Hinch, it doesn't sound right, does it? Yeah. Say. Yeah. Senator Darren Hinch. Yeah. Representing the Justice Party from the, the Good State of Victoria as well. So, uh, what I'm going to ask each of the panel members to do in no particular order, but maybe I uh, might ask Glenn first, because in a sense he's a bit unconnected or he's connected with a few different parties, so with, a, with any particular political party to represent, the question is what do we do? to make politicians take cannabis law reform seriously. I'm going to ask each of the panel members to speak for maybe about three minutes or so on that topic, a bit of an open question probably. Then we'll have questions from the floor and then everyone on the panel will get a chance to wrap up. We'll keep the questions from the floor short, please. Comments are welcome as well as questions. And uh, if just ask people to use a microphone to ask a question. There's a roving mic going around the room, so uh, when we get to that point, just put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you before you start speaking. Otherwise, no one will know what you're talking about. They might not know anyway, but they won't even hear you to know what you're talking about. <laughs> so uh, we'll pass over to Glenn Jury to uh, first of the panel members to address the question and give us the answer. What do we do to make politicians take law reform seriously? I don't know if there is an answer to that one. Um, this, I think, is my fifth Mardi Gras. Um, and every year we talk about uh, politics at this forum and how to engage with politicians. Um, I am a political strategist. I've been involved in politics and the political system now for about 20 years. So if you'd ask me how to engage with politicians, it's simply one word, it's numbers. It comes down to numbers. Um, on this stage here, interestingly, they're all blokes. No women this year. But amongst these blokes is a Member of Parliament from uh, New South Wales, a Member of the Upper House, a Member of the Greens, a Senator over there, if Fiona had showed up, there's, um, she's a Member of the Upper House in, in Victoria. Tomorrow I believe David Lanehelm will be here, Senator David Lanehelm, a Senator. Um, all of these people, as well as the Hemp Party over here, are, are pro either legalisation of cannabis, deregulation of cannabis laws, liberalisation of cannabis laws in, in various ways. And all of these people are all will be one day represented in parliaments around the country. So, from my perspective, uh, it comes down to numbers. Now, um, wars, if you like, are won at various levels. You ask a military campaigner, how do you win a war? Well, it doesn't just come from the soldiers at the front. It comes from all sorts of ways. And similarly, 
dealing with politicians or winning, winning law reform comes in all different ways. It's lobbying, it's political pressure, it's people such as yourselves in demonstrations in the streets and, and whatnot. But back to the question more specifically, how do you deal with politicians? Well, politicians are just ordinary people. Nothing really special about politicians. Um, I deal with a lot of lobbyists uh, in all sorts of different areas and I get all kinds of people coming to me, people whose views that I can sympathise with, other people's views that, that I can't. I won't mention any names, but we had uh, a prominent ex-member of the Labor Party, ex-unionist, come and talk to us yesterday, I think. And this man is now, uh, should I say, a polar opposite to the strength of his convictions, representing big companies exploiting our natural resources. And I found it very hard to take that man seriously because he obviously, to me, quite, quite simply did not have the strength of his convictions. Um, and I don't think that, um, well, from my perspective, that that's no way to deal with a politician. Um, uh, another way of not dealing with a politician, recently we had some people come and talk to us from the taxi industry and they were angry. I mean, they were really angry and and that's not a way to engage with a politician either. So if you want to talk to a politician, sure, go in there with passion, but connect, talk to them. Um, know your subject, uh, be respectful, and who knows, you might kick a goal or two along the way. Um, politicians at the end of the day, just ordinary people like, like you guys are. Um, I think the Hemp Party has done a good job in dealing with politicians. We get them in Canberra a bit. I've been involved in introducing you guys to politicians in various state parliaments around the country and federal senators and other members and whatnot. Uh, and the Hemp Party has done a very, very good job in engaging with politicians. But at the end of the day, if you really want to get things done, those who show up rule the world, get elected. That's how you get things done. Uh, going on from the numbers thing, I guess, uh, I do a lot of lobbying in South Australia. I, I don't get any funding, I can't use numbers to, to sway any, any deals and that sort of stuff, so I use people's lives instead as, as my currency. So I, I make that connection with the politician, I find out where they, where they go to church, where they do the shopping, bump into them in the park when they're with their kids and just have a chat to them. And just, just tell them who I am, how I am, if, if they know about me and that sort of stuff, and then just find out what they know and just try to get to them as a person. Like was mentioned before, the, the broadest politicians, and I'm sure when, when you ask David how he likes to be spoken to as a politician, I guess, and you can give us that perspective. It's, it's, there's lots of media stuff, and like there was media out on the street before, and they were asking all the, the hippie stoner types to like, tell us what you think about the government, and then get them riled up, and then tell us what you think about legalisation, and get them riled up. And, that's great to see on the news for all the people and they laugh about it and that sort of stuff, but it's not doing anything for, for our cause and, and what we want to do. Going on from that, but between the numbers and the lies, it's, it's really just finding out what the, what the politicians want and, and, and how they're going to get it. And if they can't get it, then, then they don't want any cause in it. So you've got to try and make it one of their invested interests and having more constituents to vote for them with the next ones. Like I said, it's just a numbers game for them. I like using using lives as my currency and trying to get that personal connection. Let's see how David likes to be spoken to. Please. Um, Q, David. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we're meeting on Aboriginal land. Actually, uh, pay my respects to the elders, past and present. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, Bundjalung people. It's a pity Fiona's not here. It's pretty blokey our panel, but. Um, uh, one way, of course, is not being exclusive in how you go and do your politics. You've got to reach out beyond your immediate circle. Um, and David, I think, does amazing work telling the stories of veterans, making it a human story, um, is a really important way of persuading people. And it's not just about persuading politicians. In large part, my view is politicians pretty much follow. Every parliament in the country is an extremely conservative institution. And no parliament, whether it's the New South Wales parliament that I suffer in, um, or it's the federal parliament, um, does anything progressive unless they're literally forced by a movement outside. That's my view. They're all very conservative. 
They don't ever go out and offer progressive change unless they're literally forced to do it by a mass movement. And that's why, you know, even though an overwhelming majority of people, I think, if you polled them, um, would be saying to the politicians, why are you wasting, you know, $1.5 billion a year on policing largely cannabis? We'd really rather you spent that police resources on policing violent crime. Everybody, when you talk to them, the overwhelming majority of the population agrees with it. But it doesn't translate because our, our parliaments are extremely, extremely conservative institutions. And I, I suppose I differ with Glenn. I, I don't think it's a question of just persuading individual politicians by having meetings with them and showing them the light. Um, even in my chamber, the New South Wales Upper House, I would say if you really sat down and asked the majority of members, they would recognise that the war on drugs is a big fail. It's an absolute fail. They recognise you can't win it. They recognise that particularly things like mobile drug testing, um, you know, that ridiculous thing that's surrounding Nimbin at the moment. That's a campaign uh, my office has been running against mobile drug testing, pointing out how it's not impairment based and the like. And um, there will be politicians in the chamber who will get up in a debate, in an emotion, and attack me and, and single myself out as, as a Greens MP who's doing this and say how outrageous it is, how I'm endangering people. And then afterwards in the corridor will say to me, oh, do you know what, David? I think you're probably onto something with that uh, mobile drug testing stuff. <laughs> because um, uh, the way that politics works and the dysfunctional way that politics works is um, they aren't actually responding to the individual wishes of the MPs, most of the political parties. Most of them are responding to fear and fear of the Daily Telegraph in New South Wales, maybe the Herald Sun um, in Victoria fear of what the shock jocks will do because, and that makes them inherently conservative. My view is we need to translate that enormous social movement across the country, which I think is there, to support the legalisation of cannabis and rational drug laws. We actually need to actually, to convert that, as Glenn would say, to the numbers and make the politicians fear that they're going to lose job and lose their power unless they actually change their votes and respond to the majority of people. Most of us want to legalise cannabis. The Greens of New South Wales have an absolute commitment to legalising cannabis. And I, and I will say at the moment, I think Richard Di Natale, the Australian Greens leader, has been going out and making some brave arguments about drug law reform and trying to change the debate federally. If he'd done that 10 years ago, we would still be talking about the negative headlines and the attacks, and he might have had to pull back. But I've got to tell you, um, when you talk to his office and you talk to Richard, they were surprised at how little the attack was from the conservative press when they went out and started making the call at a federal level for drug law reform. I think those of us who are MPs have an obligation to be braver about the calls for drug law reform, to be more direct about the calls for drug law reform, and, and have confidence that the overwhelming majority of Australians will support it if and when we make those brave arguments. Thanks. Give them a kick in the shins. You know, step on their toes, poke them in the chest, you know, get them angry, you know, because you should be angry because you've been coming here for 25 years and nothing has changed. Uh, it is obscene that we are arresting people for carrying around a plant with no intention other than to smoke it for themselves. It's absolutely ludicrous that we lock people in cages for gardening. You know, we should be not sitting in here giggling about it. We should be banging down on the doors of these politicians and saying, how obscene are you to let this stand? Because this can't stand. It's against human nature and it's against human rights. We need to get angry. And I don't, I don't know if we've mentioned yet that uh, we're all a bunch of middle-aged white blokes up here. You know, if it wasn't for me, we'd all be dressed the same. It's, we, we need to start involving everybody in this movement or we're going to be here in another 25 years going, well, I wonder why we've only made a few slight inroads into drug testing on the roads. We need to get everybody involved and 
We, up here, the middle-aged white blokes, need to make the space for people to get involved, the space for women to get involved, because you know, there's a whole realm of, of ways of doing things and, and empathy and things that come very naturally to, uh, to people who aren't middle-aged white blokes and don't come very naturally to us at all. We're, uh, you know, by and large, we're engineers and accountants and people who like numbers and, and that sort of thing. But just getting out there and expressing ourselves, getting out there and, you know, letting the freak flag fly again, like, like it did in the 60s and the 70s. Just getting out there, getting in people's faces. And they can't help but take notice if we do that. So, well, this is good and this is great and this is my favourite weekend of the year. We need to be doing it every weekend and not just in Nimbin. We need to be doing it in Cairns. We need to be doing it in Newcastle. We need to be doing it in Ballarat. We need to be doing it in Mount Isa. Just everywhere. And we need to get everybody involved because there's a whole heap of people out there who are still scared, uh, still afraid to come out and say, yes, I, I smoke pot. And, and that's a shame because there's absolutely nothing that anybody should ever be ashamed about for taking pot. It, it's not a shameful thing. And there's no reason why we should let people shame us for smoking pot or eating pot or inhaling pot vapor. Getting high is not a crime and it shouldn't be a crime. It's human nature. We want to experience the best in life and that is what pot has to offer. And it is against human nature for them to try and stop us. And as far as I'm concerned, anybody that that raises a hand and says, I do this and I don't care that you don't like it is an absolute hero to me. And the reason why politicians are scared, and the reason why they're harder to track down than, you know, helpful salespeople at Bunnings is they're scared, they're scared too, but they're scared of you because you, you hold their jobs and their futures in your hands. So, so don't be afraid to let them, let them have it. If, if you manage to bail one up at the shopping centre, say, why are you doing this to people? It's you that's doing it because you know, the standard that we walk past is the standard that we set. So if these politicians are walking past legalisation and just going, yeah, I don't want to talk about that right now, they're actively involved in the oppression. There's, there's no middle ground here. You're either with us or you're against us. And yeah, get out and get the ones who are against us. It's interesting that uh, Glenn brought up taxis earlier. Uh, a really great example of this is Uber. You know, 10 years ago, there was no Uber. They came, they set up shop, they started hooking up people who have cars with people who need a lift through their, their app and it worked. People went to drive for them, people used their product, and the government looked and said, we can't have this, we need to try and stamp it out. So they tried to make it illegal. And Uber said, we don't care. And they just kept doing it, and they kept organising meetings between people who had cars and spare time and people who needed a lift from A to B. And now they're legal in every state in the country because they said, we don't care what you think, we're going to do it anyway, and that's what we need to do. take us seriously well um, well in terms of medical cannabis right now the best thing that the whole of Australia is doing is that medical cannabis is happening in Australia there's there's thousands of people you know if not a hundred thousand people using cannabis every day for medical purposes um, because they need to I think that's making politicians take this issue a lot more seriously um, you know I'm speaking on the hemp on behalf of the hemp party so we really talk about medical industrial and recreational uses of cannabis and you know two out of three isn't bad in the last you know 12 or so months so we're, we're kind of doing all right but it's the detail around that and how how we've come to achieve those things and how we've as a party you know got to speak to, to politicians and taken us seriously and we've never really had that problem i mean you know the the argument about you know cannabis prohibition and whether it was good or not was we won that ages ago we we just know prohibition doesn't work so it's how do you change that, you know, 80 odd years of propaganda. There's still people out there that believe in reefer madness. There's still, you know, lots of politicians hanging on to their job because, you know, they are, you know, just by just supporting bad policies, which, you know, just keeps the status quo in place. Now, trying to get changes around cannabis law reform is a minefield because you, you really are, um, you know, treading on a lot of toes, whether it's um, 
you know, with medical and, and, and you've got the, the whole medical profession and the AMA. Um, with industrial hemp here in Australia, we really did have a lot of problems around police holding it back because of their, their use of saliva tests. Um, recreational cannabis seems to be almost in abeyance at the moment, but obviously poised to, to latch onto the back of medical cannabis. For us, to take, for, for politicians to take us seriously, we had to be not so much smarter than the politicians, but we were able to distill that 80 years of propaganda down to a single truth or a, a small set of truths and present that in a different way to them. And at the moment, um, we, we can do that. And, and to be honest, I can't say that, um, you know, I've met many politicians or bureaucrats or public servants or policy makers that didn't actually at a, at a human level didn't agree with what we're talking about or that prohibition doesn't work or that we need to change uh, and introduce cannabis law reforms. The problem is the numbers and how's that going to look when, you know, the opposition says this and the government attacks them, you want kids to have heroin, you know, all you'd ask for was, was cannabis. And one of the classic lines we, we, we haven't, really fought, haven't really had to use yet is, you know, with the hemp seed food debate, you know, people are going to be saying, you want kids to eat marijuana seed? Well, kids are eating heroin seed, poppy seed. They have been for ages. In fact, larger tracer amounts of opium than there ever would be of, you know, cannabinoids on, on a hemp seed. So, yeah, these are these are the kind of distilling the argument down and representing it and being able to make points from it. And so for us, it's more, um, how do we turn those numbers into, obviously, we're, we're not, you know, we haven't got senators, we haven't got, you know, state registered parties. So how do we, for us, it's almost sometimes, how do we give these votes to a politician who's going to listen and say something? The other thing we also had to realise, it's one thing to have politicians take you seriously, but when you're trying to change laws, you have to be talking to the government or a party that is poised to be in government. Um, it's only governments that can change laws. And again, you know, it's distilling the issue. Governments don't own cannabis. It's a, it's not owned by them. It's a small number of companies that do in the whole world. And even if we did talk about regulating cannabis here, we're still going to be talking about a number of companies, you know, or shops or whatever, growers owning that cannabis to be able to sell into the, a, a regulated market. It won't really be a free for all. Um, we 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 have. We don't have a constitution like the US and like Canada, which um, the, 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 the citizens or the courts can make decisions against the will of the government and the medical profession in terms of, of medical cannabis. Um, so for us, it's how do we get a government, especially at a federal level, to adopt cannabis law reforms, which would, you know, on the one hand, prove very beneficial, but also, you know, also provide lots of unintended positive consequences as a result of those cannabis law reforms. So it's how do we do that? That's the tricky part because it, it's all about numbers. And then with cannabis too, it's again distilling that, that the essence of it. It's fair to say that no government in the world has introduced or willingly introduced any kind of meaningful medical cannabis regime or recreational. So we are really, really behind it. So in one respect, we're up against it, but on the other hand, we have got cautioning schemes around the country. We have got serious talk now on, on medical cannabis. We have, and this is government, our government willingly doing this. And we have recently achieved um, hemp seed food. So we kind of should be heartened by that. And I know at a party, party level, we are. On the other hand too, we, we will gain more strength by governments not doing anything. And that's why we have to keep you know, plugging away at it. You know, the, the hemp party vote could be one, two, perhaps even, you know, a bit more than 2% overall. This is a, the Australian primary vote. Like, you know, 2% of all Australians, we already get 1% of all Australians voting for the hemp party, like, above every other issue in the, in the, that surrounds them. When they get to the privacy of that polling booth, they vote for us. Politicians take note of that and they want that. So we, we, we also get approached and by other parties as well, at, at you know, minor parties. But we really, when we're representing, you know, cannabis users of Australia, which could be, you know, 10 or more percent of, 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 of the population, we, it's just taken, it's taken us a bit of time, but we have managed to take, you know, get politicians to take us more seriously. And, and we hope people keep supporting us and other parties that 
that, that, that espouse these notions and these policies and, you know, one day we will be able to, you know, be alongside politicians where they're not only, we're not only imploring them to change laws, but they're sitting down and getting policies and committees together to find the best possible way and the quickest way that we can achieve these, these cannabis law reforms. So, um, that's how I think we can get politicians to take us more seriously by understanding our issues distilling it down, putting it into the correct context. Sometimes it's not a state context, it's a, it's a federal or international context. And, and, and presenting them to it in a way that, you know, there is numbers behind us if you do what we say and how we say it. So that's kind of where I'll leave it at that. Vote him. All right. Um, what you can do to have the politicians take notice. Well, in Canada, we have the Constitution and with that, a charter, which offers various protections such as freedom of expression, um, the um, protections of the right to life security of the person. You also have um, other protections uh, which have certainly enabled the foundations for a medical cannabis program to be put in place, not through efforts of the government, but by order of the court. So what you can do, well, sue the government is one. Uh, two, engage in, no, I gotta make this clear. I'm not advising you to break the law, I'm a lawyer, but civil disobedience has certainly worked in with respect to activism on the West Coast. Um, and it's fun as a lawyer, you never know with many of the cannabis activists what you're going to get. My parents were delighted that I've used my uh, Oxford Law degree to basically represent Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. <laughs> but it is rewarding because you are dealing with very motivated people who regardless of the state of the law, they're gonna wake up tomorrow and continue to do what they do. Now, when the other third thing I would say is you need to understand the rules of the game and the language of politics and the law better than the politicians. I mean, Malcolm X, who we're all familiar with, would read the, learn the dictionary. Because if you were going to engage in a dialogue with uh, a, a combatant or on the other side of a table, you'd need to understand the language. So there's sort of a joke that I would say to clients, yeah, you could give the establishment one middle finger and tell them to F off, or you could give them two informed middle fingers by understanding the rules of the game and the procedures and playing it smarter than they and so, Numbers are certainly a factor, but at the end of it, you're going to need to find who are the politicians that you can deal with and talk with and in a dialogue with, because when you can get to that stage, they're the ones where the buck stops. For I'll give you an example in, in Vancouver. We have, at one point, probably two years ago, there was over 120 illegal dispensaries, and that went back to a tradition starting in probably the late 90s with the BC Compassion Club, which credits itself as one of the first medical, dignified medical access points. And it was, it's not legal, it's still illegal under the law, but it's tolerated in Vancouver. Because Vancouver has a major drug problem. Like we're talking heroin and uh, opioid crisis, the downtown east side. I mean, the police have bigger fish to fry than a plant. And they've adopted that. The city of Vancouver essentially was the first municipality, and we're not talking like provincial or state or a federal level, this is a municipality that said, you know what, we have a health crisis, a public health crisis, and we think that if we introduce a system of regulations, the dispensaries will meet that, and we'll be able to prioritize resources into other areas, and so, Vancouver is also one of the first cities about 20 something years ago that introduced the safe injection site model or a supervised injection site model. Why? Because it's better to have clean needles in circulation and people do heroin than to have heroin and dirty needles in circulation. So Vancouver has 
again, through a lot of activism and constructive engagement with municipal authorities and working with police, have enabled there to be regulations which are actually with the public health, public safety uh, in mind. But when that doesn't work, you certainly need to get the attention of government. And you may have heard of, per of people in Canada such as Mark and Jody Emery who were recently arrested. Well, they were certainly doing a very good job of civil disobedience, but, oh, where, where's Steve? Sorry. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'll just conclude with civil disobedience, litigation, and understanding what the rights, rules, and uh, strategies of the game so that you can either engage in a meaningful dialogue with, with politicians or you can engage in a meaningful dialogue with them through the courts. So interesting times, I think, in cannabis and politics. Over to you, sir. Thank you. That was a great neat segue, thank you. Uh, I want to take an issue with Gabe because this thing about middle-aged white males, I'm not a middle-aged white male, I'm an old, I'm an old white male, all right? Uh, and I'm not sure I should be speaking because back in the late 1960s, I was based in New York for Fairfax and I was asked to write one of those end of decade pieces saying, what will happen in Australia by the end of 1970, not by 1980, what will happen in the next decade? And Hinch's hunch, which is often wrong, I boldly wrote that by 1980 in Australia, marijuana would be legalised. That's how far out I was. Uh, and I was just thinking while you were talking earlier about the, how we've lost the war on drugs. The, the, the war on drugs is over, I grant it. It's been lost. I recall being in Washington when Richard Nixon launched the war on drugs. Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley launched the war on drugs. That was about 45 years ago, and what a great success. And I mean, why I support the legalization of marijuana for recreational use, for any use, is because I get sick and tired of watching the TV news at night and watching these big burly coppers with guns on the hips arresting plants. It's very silly. It's very silly. Now, I think we have, as you were saying before, we have made great progress with, with, um, with medical um, use of cannabis and cannabis oil, etc. all those areas. But don't be, don't be sort of swayed in saying we're winning, the, we're winning this because that is just one area. And it's a fantastic thing that has happened. And in, even in the past year when I came here to Nimbin last, last to Mardi Gras and uh, we talked about it at great length. And, and in Victoria, probably, I think I'm fair to say, we are, we are ahead of the game at the moment. Uh, they just... I have a beautiful story here today. Uh, I was talking to a man who's had uh, brain brain injury, and he uses cannabis oil. And he, uh, I said, well, we are getting some some advances. I mean, who would have thought that we've got a cannabis oil company is on the Melbourne Stock Exchange as of this week? And they launched their shares at thirty cents, and they're now sixty cents. And he said to me, he said, Darren, I bought them at twenty cents. <laughs> I said, well, good on you. You deserve it. Um, we have come some way. The, the thing about the soldiers, which I wanted to talk about, because that is such a huge, another huge area uh, with, uh, with, with post-traumatic stress, etc., for soldiers. A lot of you wouldn't realise that um, this year, 30 veterans have suicided. Actually, the 31st I was told about was on Anzac Day. Now, that is an absolute Australian abomination, what is happening there. And I'm very pleased that we've got involved with, I'll talk to you later if you like about, we've got involved with, with soldiers and, and the Australian Veterans Art Museum, which will be opening in, 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 um, in Victoria. And it was, it was Weary Dunlop who said that how art is so important to people like that. So the, the, the cannabis oil area, and I'm getting off the track here a bit, but that is so important to get involved there. Um, I, I hope you can, you, you, you can get, get ahead, further ahead with this. I hope we can do it. Uh, as I said, I'd legalise uh, marijuana if, if, we, if we could uh, get the numbers. The, the thing, as Glenn was alluding to, push the crossbenches, especially federally. We do have power because now they need us. Um, they, uh, the, Labor, the Labor Party and, the, and the, the government, they need us to either support their amendments at various times. So that's where we can put some pressure on things. Um, I am worried about the synthetic aspect of what's been, what's been going on. I cannot understand why Australia has, has, import, has to import so much of a product when it should be truly should be grown here. I, I had a meeting with people from Norfolk Island in, in Canberra only about three weeks ago. I cannot understand why the federal government 
and, and the, then the Norfolk Island administrator thwarted the idea. It could be a great product. Norfolk Island could become like the, the, the poppy capital of Tas in Tasmania, could become one of the great producers of cannabis oil uh, in, in Australia, and, and would have saved a, a, an island which is desperate for industry. So in those areas, and, and with the clothing, with the whole sort of stuff, I think it can be done. I, 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 look, I'm, I, as, and I know I sound a, a, like a politician, but before I jumped the shark and became one, the last story I did was for Sunday night for uh, Channel 7, and it was about medicinal cannabis. And we wondered whether we would ever get the oil legalised in Victoria. That was about two and a half years ago. It's now starting. So there, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but I always know that beware, it may be an express train coming the other way. Thank you. Some interesting and uh, insightful observations, I think, for the people up the front. Never enough time, of course. We've got about 10 minutes, I think, before the uh, fashion parade begins. So, uh, questions from the floor. We uh, might grab. Yeah, put your hand up and I'll come hands running. Up, please. Yep, I'm In, coming. Um, I'm Miss, Miss uh, Dr. Jiggins. Here we go. The lights up here are very bright. Uh, I can see. Uh, All right. John, a question. Before you ask a question, given the limits of time, I'm just going to randomly pick two people to answer any question, unless it's to anyone in particular. So any questions from the floor that are fairly general, I'm just going to randomly pick two people to answer it. But go ahead, John. Well, is it a question of convincing the politicians, or is it a question of convincing the bureaucrats? If you look at who controls the rules we're going to get on medical cannabis, it's the health department and the police. And that's who the politicians bow to. So that's the question I'd like you know, people to try and attempt uh, to answer. Is it politicians? I mean, politicians we can threaten to vote out. How do we get rid of the bureaucrats in the health department and the police? Uh, you, look, you're right. You're right to agree on that. And there's, I'm learning there's a touch of yes, but more than a touch of yes, Minister uh, in, in Canberra, uh, and you know that New South Wales as well. There is, but the politicians, we, we still have the clout. I mean, we can, we can still you know, hit hard if we have to hit hard, and uh, you can subvert the, the bureaucrats. Although, um, to, to add to your argument, I was in a town called Melton in Victoria the other day, where there's a huge spread of, uh, of, of Melbourne, and I, I was approached by a man who said, can you do something to try and, you know, can, can we get a chemist shop in our community, because I didn't know this, do you know you're not allowed to put a, put a chemist shop in a community within nine kilometres of another chemist shop unless you have the permission of the Federal Minister for Health? That is yes, Minister, to a degree. Any other answers? David, have an answer? Yeah. Uh, there is a huge amount of power in the bureaucrats, and I suppose I could just um, go back to the experience in Vancouver and in Sydney on the medical injecting centres. Uh, we have one in, in New South Wales, in King's Cross, uh, supervised injecting centres. And the reason we got that was a mixture of brave activists going out and staring down the law and saying, arrest us, we're going to provide clean needles because we want to deal with a health crisis. But then we also had the then police commissioner actually say, OK, I'm now going to direct the police in the area to use their discretion and not arrest drug users who are going to that facility. And, and, and there's always that discretion in the New South Wales police um, to not arrest people, to not use their powers of arrest um, if they don't think it's appropriate in a particular circumstance. But we have had, we've just got rid of Andrew Scipioni as the New South Wales Police Commissioner, which should get a cheer, um, because he was fervently against, aggressively against um, any kind of drug use and was very aggressively forcing the police to use their existing powers. Um, and in fact, he was the one who basically woke up a 2007 law about three or four years ago and said, this law's been on the statute books, we haven't been using it enough, and he's the one who pushed for the resources to do all that mobile drug testing. That law had been around for years, but he insisted on police using it, and I think using it for great social harm. There is a, a vast amount of discretion. We've got a new police commissioner in New South Wales. I would hope that we will be having conversations with him about using that discretion to pull back from some of the excesses. And, and I do think there are a number of brave people in the New South Wales Police, not all, but some of them who are desperately unhappy with the job they have 
of monstering the community on drug laws. There are some desperately unhappy. That's not what they joined the police to do. Um, and maybe some of those personal stories can be told through the likes of David because um, I think why we got medicinal cannabis reform was actually a lot of brave personal stories. That wasn't a social movement. It was a lot of brave personal stories. So I'd be interested in David's perspective on how we could get some of those courageous stories being told to change the mindset. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Thank you. Or, uh, yeah, or is Damon going to say something? Uh, no, I think David pretty much cleared it up pretty well. <laughs> There's, um, to, just to quickly, and I'll only take 30 seconds. In South Australia, we have a lot of bureaucrats and our health minister, Jack Snelling, can't be contacted by anyone about cannabis at any time. He just blackballed everybody. So we had to deal with the bureaucrats and we had to change some of those bureaucrats' minds just through those personal connections. And by doing that, we were able to move the, the portfolio away from the health minister and bounce it off the substance abuse minister and it's now in the hands of the innovation minister. So Minister Kai Ma in South Australia is a good egg. He's a, he's a young guy as well. He's a middle-aged bloke like us, but he's doing great things for cannabis and you can see, see the light at the end of the tunnel. So keep smashing those bureaucrats. They, they can lead you to where you want to go sometimes. Oh, uh, good evening, everyone. Look, this is, it's not a joke, but it might be a joke. Um, I think the, uh, the way to persuade politicians is already, um, the example is already out there. The coal industry, they've, uh, they've managed to change laws. I know I've almost been arrested and uh, and taken to jail and fined and all sorts of things for protesting. Now, that wasn't a law before. Now, they get, um, they persuade politicians by large donations. Now, how that seems to work with politicians because these, um, these companies can, can get things swayed in their direction any time they uh, fork over some money. So is it, do you think that, uh, I've heard a few estimations of the illegal uh, yeah. cannabis trade in Australia, and it's rather large. Do you think a levy <laughs> on producers <laughs> could raise enough funds to outbribe? <laughs> I don't know, the, the liquor industry and the, uh, and the energy industry and the mining industry. And Good on you for playing the game. <laughs> wheels within wheels. Yeah, we know right. how to do it, don't we? So who's going to say something about that? Can I just say one thing. The ones who are making the money out of out of drugs at the moment, illegal drugs, um, desperately don't want the laws changed. Outlaw motorcycle gangs, organised crime, they are they're the ones who are making the money from the illegality of cannabis in particular, um, and, and and they are desperate not to change the law. If uh, and that's the problem, the the stupidity we have with the uh, prohibition means that all of the money, the, the billions of dollars that are spent every year in, in Australia on, on illegal drugs, it all goes to basically criminal elements. And uh, I was speaking earlier at Mardi Gras about how the New South Wales Crime Commission, you know, the chief organised crime agency, probably in Australia, I think, has said it clearly. Organised crime in Australia is 100% paid for by um, illegal drugs and prohibition drives organised crime, and organised crime don't want the laws changed. Um, I think getting that story out about how prohibition actually creates outlaw motorcycles, gang, organised crime and violence on our streets is part of the story. Can I just address that point of money and politics? Regrettably, you're right. Uh, I see it all the time uh, in the conservative side of politics, and no doubt you see it too, David, and others that are represented in the parliament see it too. It is not overt. Um, but big companies that donate huge amounts of money have access. They just do. Unions have access to the ALP. Um, it's not like it is in the US here, but it certainly does exist. So I'd be quite prepared to pass a hat around here tonight and collect some money uh, and take it off to camp and see what we can do. So I'll give you my bank account details. Uh, <laughs> but as an extension of that, well, there yes, actually, they, they, they often... <laughs> Darren and I are very well, well aware of this. Um, uh, and I'm going to pick on the Labor Party again, but it happens on the other side too. Of, of two members of the Labor Party who... who uh, and I, I don't mean to pick on the Labor Party, it happens everywhere, probably in the Greens as well, 
Um, uh, these members of the Labor Party that stood up there fighting for workers' rights are now working for organisations that are uh, almost um, quintessentially opposed to that. So the term strength of one's convictions kind of come up somewhere. But it, almost no more time. Just to to that, just one more little bit we, about the, um, the yeah, those donations and that. I mean, there is a lot of companies and a lot of organisations and even um, government departments that are in in effect making money from 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 prohibition. They they are you know doing the lobbying. They are spending. So it's not just donations to a political party. Um, there's lobbyists, lobby companies. I mean, anyone should just Google lobby companies in Australia. And there's, there's a whole range of them. Um, but, you know, for, for an organisation like, you know, say it was the Hemp Party or the Hemp Movement is to, to want to make big donations, our donations have to be bigger than, you know, the donations made by private prison guards union we, our, our, and, and those types of things. Or, you know, obviously there was a lot of lobbying done by, you know, by people on behalf of the, the company that supplies the saliva test to all, to all the police around the, the country. So our donations would have to be bigger than that and our story would have to not only be better but circumvent the story that they've presented about how good you know, saliva testing you know, or, or locking people up or, 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 or just things like that. So, um, and, and actually just reminds me, last year around the election time we had a, um, a, a federal um, MP, ex-Liberal MP, Jackie Kelly, um, and this was on Hostar, you know, Fox Channel News being interviewed, very disgruntled about the Liberal Party talking about you know, the, the lobby companies that run, run the, the New South Wales Liberal Party. And when she was asked, well, who are these companies? She said straight off the bat, Merck and Johnson and Johnson. So we have Big Pharma. Again, we're talking about cannabis. But it's a worldwide thing. You know, no government has made cannabis legal. But to understand that you know, a disgruntled liberal, federal Liberal Party member who was very well in with the Liberal Party saying that two big pharmaceutical companies have a direct line of power into a state government like us. It may, it's got to make you wonder. Thank you. We've got time to squeeze one more, one last question in. Woman at the front, please. I, I think if you look around this room tonight, there are a lot of middle-aged, respectable people. Probably on behalf of everybody here today, and especially here tonight, thanks guys for what you've, the information you've given to all of us, it's been enlightening. We're not going to change our ways. We are going to continue to smoke a bit of pot. Um, that isn't going to change globally. It hasn't changed in centuries and it ain't going to change now. So you can sit there, you can take us to, you know, conferences and put it through government and you can da-da-da. It probably isn't going to change, as our man from the Hemp Party said yesterday. There's a long way to go. But perhaps what has to happen is a bit more tolerance. You know, I'm a middle-aged grandma. I stopped smoking dope some years ago. Um, but I have friends 10 years, 20 years older than me who are going to continue to and will always. I have neighbours who are very, very sick uh, with cancer and are in remission after, after having oil that's made by another neighbour. We need to see some tolerance in cannabis, um, cannabis growing, cannabis, cannabis seed. Um, it was demonised by the nylon industry a long time ago. So, if, if you take any message out of here tonight to state governments, federal government, wherever, perhaps it's time for some tolerance. We're not all, you know, half-wits and idiots doing damage to our families, our spouses, our jobs or whatever. No, we, we all are all middle-aged, respectable people. And I think we'd like to be treated with some respect for a pastime that we all really enjoy to do, whether it's our parents or our kids or us. And I think it's time that we were treated with a bit more respect and not the bullying, because that's what you do. They bully us for this pastime. So Absolutely. give us a break. Thanks. Any quick responses from the panel members? 
Well, we just all agree. I think we just agree with that. By acclamation. Well said. Well said. But we have to get on with the rest of the very full Mardi Gras program. There's the fashion parade about to occur in a matter of two minutes, I think, or whatever. It's very, very soon. So, look, thank you very much once again. I hope that was uh, useful. It sounded very useful and important from up here. I hope it made sense to everyone uh, in the audience. Thank you for participating. Glenn, Damon, uh, David, uh, Gay, um, oh, and, and I was... Rob, yep. and me. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and tomorrow.